Welcome, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, more, uh, uh, Colleen, please remind me to turn it off, too. A few weeks ago, I've got to turn it off for two hours. So. <laughs> Will do. Enjoy. Okay. Anyway, um, who was... Was somebody asking a question? Oh, yeah. No, no. Continue to read this, uh, starting with verse 4. The clothing did not fall from you in tatters, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. So now you think must- about it. Wearing clothing for 40 years in the desert without showers, mm. without deodorant. Uh, thanks. So Eating manna. <laughs> they had plenty of social distancing back then. <laughs> so I would have kept away from them. Go ahead. So you must realize that the Lord, your God, disciples, disciplines you, even a man disciplines his son. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, by walking in his ways and fearing him. So these, verses, the Lord, these verses remind us that God will take care of us. You know, clothing didn't end up in tatters. Our feet didn't swell, even though we were walking miles and miles every day. God will take care of us. We just have to keep the commandments. Okay. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Can I ask you something before you go on? Sure. Please. The last um, couple of words, and fearing him. Why, um, if God is going to take care of you and that's a positive, why are we using the word fear, which yeah. seems negative? Well, uh, uh, yeah, we, we immediately consider fear something that is negative. But it's also a positive thing. It's, it's something that keeps us alert and aware. Um, we don't like fear, but it's something that, that keeps us as yeah. alert. You know, I, I, I'm driving my bike through the, the, uh, the neighborhood now because there aren't many cars. But I'm always afraid of being hit. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. So what what this talks about is not not the, the anxious fear. But the attentive fear, the awareness of who God is, the Almighty, the All Powerful. Does that make sense? On senior, excuse me. Uh, once I heard oh, that I heard that fear is is really honor. Uh, it's it's not it, that in translation we it's more of honoring God, which in in, in probably you're going to obey. Yeah, well, that's that, that's what you're finding some of the. Uh, friendlier uh, Bibles use. It's not an accurate translation, but it, it's, oh, more, okay. it's more of a, oh, of a, oh. but a it's, translation that's easier for us to understand. Than oh. acceptable. Um, but it's also, it's not passive emotion. It's, um, you're not supposed to just be passively afraid. You're actually supposed to be aggressively welcoming of what it brings to you. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's well put. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. You know, in, in fear, you, you respond appropriately. You, you call mm. the parents call. Yeah. Well, and you're, do, we, do we have any idea how many people followed this for, for the 40 years? Were there dropouts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, you ask a good question. And again, the estimates are somewhere between 30 and 60,000. We're talking wow. about a big, a big crowd. And remember, they weren't all just the descendants of Jacob. Um, there was this, there was, uh, the, this is what they're thinking, there was this mass exodus of people who were unhappy with what was going on in Egypt, and they kind of tagged along. Um, did they all stay with him for 40 years? I doubt it. Was it actually 40 years? We don't know. Right, right. We don't even know where they went. Because <laughs> yeah, so. the circumstances under which they were living were dire, hardly puts it, <laughs> hardly describes it. Well, but, but unfortunately, that's the way most of the people lived back then. I mean, that, that, in, well, especially yeah. in that area, that was, it was a desert area. You lived up there. It was a harsh life. So the, the, the good thing was you weren't under the oppressive rule of the Egyptians. Whatever you worked for, very hard is yours. Yeah. You were you were taxed. Well, oh. So 
So they were willing to put up with that because at least they weren't being oppressed by by the Egyptians or somebody else. Right. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Maureen. For the Lord your God <coughs> is bringing you into a good country, a land with streams of water, with springs and mountains welling up in the hills and valleys. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, of olive trees and of honey. A land where you can eat bread without stint and where you will lack nothing. A land whose stones contain iron and, who in, and in whose hills you can mine copper. Yeah, that's, so uh, those of you who have been to the Holy Land, usually you go in the late spring or in the summer, and it's pretty dry there. Uh, in, the, in the early spring, however, it's a lot it's of water. It's very verdant. In fact, it got floods, as, as, as you recall, uh, those of you who were with us on the pilgrimage, yeah, when you we went to Masada, they had those huge cisterns where they stored the water. But the water mm -hmm. was just flowing down the mountains in the in these heavy rains so in the spring it's really beautiful i've been there in the early spring and the fields are just filled with flowering uh, plants and it just it's just really verdant and another interesting thing is notice it says here um, uh, iron and copper um, now this is interesting because um, iron and copper are indeed present there but they weren't found until around nine BC, so clearly after the time of Moses. So again, real, real clear evidence that this is not uh, part of the uh, uh, original speech from Moses. If, if you forget the speech, but it's also very interesting. Uh, most recent archaeological studies are uh, tending toward thinking that that was the source of Solomon's wealth, the iron and copper mines. I think. Oh Solomon's yeah. Mm -hmm. Great used for making weapons and so he became a merchant in weaponry that's how he made his his, his millions very very interesting <clears throat> people always wondered where where how solomon got so wealthy but that's that's possibly where he, where he got his wealth okay, as, a, as a merchant in arms yeah go ahead first step. But, but when you have eaten your fill you must bless the Lord your God for the good country he has given you. Be careful not to forget the Lord your God by neglecting his commandments and decrees and statutes, which I enjoin on you today. Lest when you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and lived in them and have increased your herds and flocks, your silver and gold and all your property, now, verse 14, we will start, we will hear again. You then, you then, you then become haughty of heart and unmindful of the Lord, your God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert with its Sarah serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your fathers, that he might afflict you and test you, but also make you prosperous in the end. But here we see, notice over and over again, Moses is calling them to worship who? Yahweh, the Lord. Notice over and over again that, that, that the word Lord is in there. They were constantly at that time struggling with that polytheism. They would worship the gods and goddesses of the people around them. So he's calling them back to worshiping the one true God. And he's reminding them why. Because he's the one who freed them from the slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land. And so, uh, as, as Laura said, it's, it's very evident that this was, this was written at a time either just before the exile or or during the exile, uh, as a reminder to them that God had done this all for you, and what did you do? You went around and worshipped the false gods. Okay, so it's, it's a 
it's a reminder to them to make sure that they worship only the one true God. Got that? But it also, um, Monsignor, not to be political, but it also certainly speaks to today and what's going on with the Confederacy. Um, I put that, I, I use the word carefully with the toppling of statues, with the flag and everything else. So it really is speaking to our current times very, very strongly. I'm not sure what you put. I'm not getting your point. I don't get it. <laughs> Pardon me? I'm not getting your point. Oh, um, that... All right, how about we just leave it having entered? I think we're in the yellow phase. Right. Right. That we have been taken care of. We have been um, given all kinds of gifts during the stay at home. And hopefully, people have realized um, the gifts that have been given during that time. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of gifts are you talking about? Um, personally, I'm speaking about doing an awful lot of inner life work and faith work, which could not have been done in the press of the normal day. And mm -hmm. I wish more people had an inner life and didn't go out and play golf, um, but stayed at home and really thought about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So it's giving you time to reflect. Yes, very, very much so. And I'm now that it's over, I've been assessing, you know, I'm a professor, so you assess. Um, and it was really a valuable time. I'm really hoping that a lot of people in retrospect found it valuable, mm -hmm. which is what he's indicating here. Mm -hmm. I have to say, it's it, it, unfortunately, it's been busier for me. So that, that has not been yeah. not for me. But, but at the same time, it has it has indeed helped me to realize much more what blessings we have. Mm -hmm. and, and they come from God. They're not that are making, they're God's making. Anybody else want to talk to that? <coughs> okay, so, so that sets the stage for us. The, the, the context is the Exodus, and the nourishment that he offers us is the manna from heaven that, that nourished the people in their 40 year journey okay so that speaks of god present to them very clearly uh, at, through their exodus as they passed from slavery in egypt into the promised land okay make sense okay. that prepares us then for the gospel um, this is a very important passage um, in the gospel of john it's it's part of the bread of life discourse that we find in John chapter 6. Let's look at John chapter 6. Monsignor, while we're on our way there, um, there is, there is a sequence in my missalette, and there was a sequence for Pentecost. Can can you tell us what the purpose of sequences are in the Mass, please? Ah, sure, sure. Again, that, that has, has Middle Ages roots. Um, it was a way to extend the celebration uh, to to focus on the importance of that particular celebration. And so uh, you'll you notice that there, there, there are uh, hymns that are used specifically for those. You can't select any hymn. You have to use that hymn. Um, so they, they, they speak to us of that particular feast. The Feast of Pentecost, we focus on the Holy Spirit. And the Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ, we focus on the, the bread that God gives us. So, and so just two or three throughout the year, Easter, Pentecost. I didn't even realize there was one for Corpus Christi. Oh, uh, was there one last week for Holy Trinity? Yeah, there was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is it optional? Is it optional? optional? Do all optional. parishes read it or sing the it? Holy Trinity is a sequence? I don't know. Maybe I not. Think there was one last week. Not yeah, last week it did. Pardon? I'm looking. I'm not no. Aware of it. Just, no, no, was there that. wasn't. Not in my missalette, anyway. As far as I know, just Pentecost and Corpus Christi. And Easter, right? Is there a sequence, or what is, is oh, that yeah. called something different? Yeah, that's yeah. right, Easter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's nothing for there's nothing for Christmas. No, and and it's just again one of those um, 
opportunities that have been used down through the ages to to extend the celebration. Uh, the only one, uh, for example, the one for, for this Sunday is not is not required. Uh, it's just for Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost that they're that they're required. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Get back to John. 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 Uh, can you what chapter? I'm sorry. What, what chapter? What verse? Chapter six. Chapter six. Verse one. Well, let, let's just start from the very beginning, okay? <laughs> because chapter six starts with the multiplication of the loaves. So it's it's John's version of the multiplication of the loaves. And remember, in John's gospel, there are no miracles. There are only signs. Signs, exactly. Okay. So very clearly, the multiplication of loaves is a sign of the Eucharist. It anticipates the Eucharist, where he shares multiplication of loaves. He shares bread and fish. In the Eucharist, he shares his body and bread and wine. So um, it's 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 the sign for that. And immediately after that, in John's chapter, we see this wonderful bread of life discourse, starting with verse thirty-two. What we hear on Sunday starts with verse 51. Let's let's turn to 51 of chapter 8 of John's Gospel. Okay. A chapter. Uh, chapter 6. What did I say? Sorry. Chapter 6. Okay. 51. Ed, you haven't read for a while. Have a read. Verse 51. Um, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Okay. Now, we hear that, but uh, it's, it's set in the context of what we hear in verse 48. Verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors are the manna in the desert. But they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. We don't hear that. But again, for the Jewish people of, of, of the time of John, they would automatically already be aware of that. So they, you wouldn't need to. Mm. Okay, but, but I just present that to you to remember that that's, it's, it's set in opposition to the manna that they ate in the desert. So they ate it and died. Okay? So here we see in verse 51, that I am the bread of life. And, and very clearly that came down from heaven. And whoever eats this bread will live forever, unlike the people who ate the manna in the desert. So Jesus starts speaking very, very powerfully of the resurrection, of new life, of the eternal life that he's offering. But then he says, the bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. Okay, now, up to this point in this Bread of Life discourse, he speaks indirectly about the Bread of Life. Now, it could have been referring to the manna, but now he makes it very clear that he's speaking of his own flesh. Now, again, be careful with this. We, we, use, we use, in the English translation, we use the word flesh, but what is, what's, the, what's the Greek word here? No idea. And, and, <laughs> And, and what is not the Greek word here? It's on the tip of my tongue. Can't remember it. Oh. So it's Opa. Sarx. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you. At least somebody here. It's, it's, it's very, very important. Um, and we miss it in the translation. So it, 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 Maybe so you can much. say sarks and not snarks. <laughs> Every time you see in, in all the Gospels, he speaks of his, this body, this bread becoming his flesh. He uses the word soma and not the word sarks. And why do I make that distinction? Well, for the Greek speaking person, sarks speaks of your flesh, skin and bone. Okay? Soma speaks of your person. Your being, your essence, or in Latin, your substance, and we'll talk about that later. So very clearly, they understood he was saying something slightly different than what what the 
the Romans were accusing them of cannibalism. He wasn't speaking of uh, eating his flesh. He was speaking of giving his body, his presence. You see that? Very important to understand that distinction. Okay. So the, the, the true Eucharistic presence is revealed here, and his teaching suddenly takes on a new meaning. Now, that it's that we find this in John's Gospel. Remember, John's Gospel is written somewhere between 90 and 120 AD. So it's, it's, it's 60 to 80 years after the death of our Lord. That he has to use this language that speaks of the fact that they're still struggling with understanding what Jesus was saying. Remember, in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we just have the institution of the Eucharist. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. You don't find that in John's Gospel. But you do find here very clearly the theological explanation of it. You see that? Very important. Go ahead. Verse 52. The Jews quarreled among themselves. Saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus. Stop for a moment here. <coughs> it's also very interesting that if you read it in the original Greek, I'm sure you'll go and read it right away after the discussion. Can't wait. <laughs> Are you joking? Are you joking with us? <laughs> in the Greek here, it does say sarx. Very, very interesting. So it's showing, again, their misunderstanding. Jesus speaks of his stoma. They reduce it to sarx. Go ahead. Jesus said to Wait, can I just ask a quick question? Did the Hebrews have a distinction? Uh, no, and, and, and you asked a good question in that regard. Uh, John's Gospel was written originally in? Aramaic? I don't know. That's right, Aramaic. Yeah, yes, yes. And in, in Aramaic, there is a distinction. And so when it was translated into the Greek, it was very easy to, to transfer that. So when the Jews were repulsed by the idea of Sarx, it was you know because of blood and the idea that God gives us life through blood. Like they 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 said you know it was really bad for somebody to consume blood. That's why they had like the kosher <coughs> meats that they drain the blood out. Okay, no, that, that that's not Sarx. That's blood. That's it's something else. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah. Remember the okay. Yeah, this is, you were talking about. Yeah, I'm really confused. Well, no, <laughs> about okay, yeah. I, I thought I understood. Yeah, no, no, uh, and we'll get a, get into that in a moment here. We're, we're talking about drinking his blood. There, there was a real existential struggle for them because exactly as you said, they understood blood to be the source of life, and that's exactly why Jesus uses that because he is the source of life. But that makes him God. See that? We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Okay, stop right here. Uh, now, this is also very interesting because you see he uses the word in verse 40, 54, he uses eat. Okay. Um, I think it's in your footnotes. Did you find your footnotes? 54. Yeah, if you look in your footnotes, it says here uh, the verb used in these verses is not the classical Greek verb used of human eating, but that of animal eating to munch or gnaw. This may be part of John's emphasis on the reality of the flesh and blood of Jesus. But the same verb, the verb eventually became the ordinary verb in Greek, meaning eating. So John is using it to, to, to focus on the fact that this really is something, it's, it's, it's not imaginative, it's real, and, and you need to chew on it. Um, uh, most of us grew up with Sister... Um, Mary Joseph telling us, don't chew on the host, okay? Let yeah. it just dissolve because it was irreverent. Yeah. And when when I was in the seminary uh, in California, they said, do chew on the host. Hmm. 
Remember, you are consuming our Lord. You are participating in that sacrifice. He is giving himself to you. And that's what John is focusing on here. That, that yeah, you, you, when you eat this, you are, you are actually consuming the real presence of God. So he, he's making it very, very emphatic. Okay? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And let me just, uh, as, as Laura is asking about drinking, um, <coughs> here it's, it's, it is very clear that, uh, that he uses the term blood, and blood is blood. Uh, but remember, as I just mentioned, blood for them was the life force. That's why when the Jewish people even until today, kosher meat has to have all the blood drained out of it. Um, that, that, that comes from the, 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 the hygienic recognition that if you eat meat that has blood in it, you'll often get very sick because the blood has all kinds of wonderful <clears throat> enzymes and germs in it. And so... Because remember, among, among the Jewish people, their notion of blessing from God was a long life. You didn't want to get sick. And so you would drain the blood out of animals. Uh, and that then became part of their, their kosher regulations. But Jesus is making it very clear here that as the blood, he is the life force. Okay. Does that make sense, Laura? Yeah, good, good. Go ahead. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Okay, stop right there. Now pay attention here. We, we focus, we always focus on the fact that this is really Jesus and this is his body and blood. And that's all very important. But pay attention to, to this. What Jesus is calling us to is not just eating his body and blood for our nourishment, but it's so that he can remain in us and we can remain in him. We become united Jesus. He's not just nourishing us. He becomes one with us. We become one with him. And then, go ahead. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. Now, what does that phrase, and what does that one sentence immediately remind you of? Another phrase, another, another image that Jesus used. He's Oh, somebody, please. Is it like I am the vine and you are the branches? Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you cannot live. But if you if you consume me, then you have my life within you. What a powerful phrase that is. What a powerful mm -hmm. concept that is. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said while teaching in the synagogues of Capernaum. Okay. So uh, interesting that you see this, these things <coughs> while teaching the synagogues in Capernaum, but John's gospel uses that to recognize that Jesus is the Jewish people, which would, as you can understand, really struggle with that. Um, so we have, um, yeah. please, yes, please, yes. Uh, just because um, I'm still streaming masses, we have to admit doing the um, receiving communion, but not really receiving it, the prayer that you've been so nicely sharing with us, is not quite as fulfilling as actually getting the host. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels like. It. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. How can how yeah, how how can say something so that I can combat that and really understand that it's exactly the same thing? Well, it's not the same thing. No. Yeah, but I should still feel better about at least doing that. Oh, okay, very true. And that prayer says that very clearly, doesn't it? Because it says. I know that you are with me. Uh, yeah. The Eucharist is that, that clearest sign here on earth of God being present to us. But don't we believe that God holds us in existence by his presence every moment of our lives? We're not, we're not deists. We don't believe that God just kind of wound us up and put us down. God, God's presence in us is what keeps us, what sustains us, what keeps all the universe in existence. 
And so, uh, yes, God is still present with us without the Eucharist. But the Eucharist is that specific sign. Remember, we are we're an incarnation of people. We need signs, a specific sign of God being present to us, and we can focus on it there and then. Um, you know, we priests are, are, are supposed to celebrate Mass only once a day, by exception twice a day. Why? Because it's really hard work focusing on what's going on. Through us, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. And we have the privilege of sharing that with those who come to communion. That takes a I'm, I'm exhausted after Mass. It, it's, a, it's a real focus and awareness of what that sacred moment that is occurring. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's different than the everyday reality that God keeps us in existence. It's a sign that he is truly with us as he nourishes us. Does that make sense? So you see, you yeah, see it? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's really a key point in, as I think about this, because you could be in a situation where you say it's important to go to communion, but then you don't think about God's interaction in the rest of your days or the rest of your lives. As opposed, to, and I don't want to say as opposed to this, but the one thing that we have now, when we when we don't, when we didn't have the Eucharist, is we have this aware. We have to have this awareness that God is with us every every minute of our lives, and that and that to me is an enrichment above just above just receiving. Again, as I say over and over again, it's both and. You're you're absolutely right. Yeah, and and this absence, I hope, has made the heart grow fonder. You you become oh, yeah. aware. You become aware of how special the sacraments, all the sacraments are, uh, but but you're, you're absolutely right Ed, that, that that being being deprived of it also helps you realize no God is indeed with you all the time. There's never a moment when God isn't with you. Um, is Monsignor, now Monsignor, now that we're in the yellow, um, are are you allowed to go to hospitals to give communion to people now? Um, I, I don't know that. Because yeah, um, I just think of all of the people who are <laughs> sick who are craving it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that. I, I haven't heard from Wayne Center yet. Uh, we in these five parishes uh, don't go to the hospital unless you ask us to, because we have a we have a priest who who covers a uh, Rimmer Hospital oh, and this yeah. for us. Oh, okay. I haven't any conversation with him. Or did you have something to say? No? Okay, good. Okay, so when you were saying about receiving the host Sunday, you know, was the first time I've gotten to Mass, and you mentioned nourishment, and to me it is the nourishment that you really know that Jesus is in you the whole time. And the spiritual communions, which we've been saying, um, he is with you, but it's just different. Um, yeah. So that was extraordinary. But I had, not sad news, but my cousin who lives in New Jersey, I found this crazy as usual because it is spacing. And I think St. Catherine's did a fabulous job and most churches will. They just told anyone over, over 65 not to come to church. I thought that was outrageous, but I'm happy I'm here at St. Catherine's. That's all I want to say. Well, that, that would eliminate me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sixty-five. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's there's no magic number. It's no. you know if if your health exactly. prevention um, you know that. So yes. okay. So you understand that yeah. it's, a, it's a very very powerful message yeah. to us that that in, in receiving Holy Communion, not only does God nourish us, but we become one with God. That that mm -hmm. unity that that was destroyed with original sin. Is, is restored in that sacrament. What a, what a powerful reality that is. Good. And because Monsignor, of that. Monsignor. Yes. It, it's, it's really a foreshadowing of our um, our unity with the, the Trinity in heaven. Um, Absolutely. But and but what I what I understand from this and and also another book that I read um, that helped me understand it is that um will be part of the trinity through jesus because um he will 
because we are attached to him. Um, and it says clearly here that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. So it's another affirmation of the unity with Jesus brings us into the life of the Trinity in heaven. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more at, at the very end. That, 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 that this yeah. prepares us. This is a foreshadowing of an nourishment <clears throat> toward the, the heavenly banquet. And, and your officer also on that, right? That's why Jesus came into our midst, so that we had that mediator between us and God. And so everything we do is absolutely. Now, let's, before we move to 1 Corinthians, let's quickly read also uh, verse, 60, verse 60 of that same ch chapter, verse 60. Verse 60. Right. And many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. You can accept it. Okay, so pay attention to that. It is a hard teaching. It requires faith to accept it. And we all know people who, who just don't. It does require faith, uh, and it is a hard teaching. And, and, and be at, at ease with that. It's 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 something beyond our comprehension, and, and it calls for a real act of faith. And verse sixty-six. Right. Verse sixty-six. Sixty-six. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life. No longer accompanied him. So, as I, as I mentioned, it's, it's hard. And, um, you know, we had the, the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, and a lot of it was political. But some of it was also theological. Even today, most Protestants do not believe in the real presence. For them, it's a reminder of the memorial. We're really privileged to believe that. So, sit in that. Be, be, be aware of that great gift that you have of, of the faith in the real presence of Jesus present in you. How privileged we are. Good. And because of that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians, because it's, it's, this, this is also part of this Sunday history. We have a very interesting yeah. admission. Oh, Joanna. Me? Excuse me. I, I just saw Joanna Ehart is joining, joining us. Yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> From the beginning? Ten. What verse? Peggy. Peggy Murphy, you haven't read for a long time. Would you mind reading? Peggy, are you paying attention? Me? To yeah, you. Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hate reading. <laughs> uh, read it, chapter 10. Verse 1. <laughs> starting, with verse, starting, starting with verse 10 of 1 Corinthians. This is a this is a, a portion of Paul's admonition to the people of Corinth to avoid idolatry. That, that was remember that was a big struggle that they had uh, because he was going into Corinth, which as you know was was not part of the Jewish world. It was a it was a, a pagan world, and so he met the people who oh they believed in God and in Jesus, uh, mm -hmm. but they believed in, in God as as well as all the other Greek gods that they believed. To believe in the one person. Do not grumble as some of them did and suffer death no, start, by the destroyer. Start, start no, verse, no. 10, verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 16. Verse 16. Oh. oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I'm awake. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Stop right there. Okay. Uh, these verses have, have long been very precious to me. Uh, 
Um, one so current. Those, those of you who, who attend daily mass see that I sometimes use a chalice, uh, the silver one, the silver chalice that has a round cup, a little more ornate than I usually use. It's the the, the chalice of one of my great uncles, oh. in 1924, uh, wow. when he was a priest in the Netherlands, and inscribed on the very bottom of it in Latin is the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? So. Uh, for me, this is very, very personally important. Um, but these two terms, uh, the bread, bread we break, this is not a participation in the body of Christ. Um, these, these two admissions from, uh, from Paul uh, are a reminder that we're sharing in Christ, whether <coughs> God or goddess, um, and they have all these rituals that were tributes to the various gods and goddesses of the Greek world. Yeah. It was very clear the participation in the body and blood of Christ. Monsignor, excuse me, I, I don't think I have the right place. Would you say again the chapter? We're in Corinthians, correct? Yeah, one, one Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, chapter 10. Oh, chapter one 10. Corinthians chapter 10. Got it. Thank you. Starting with verse 16. Yeah. Continue. Please. Please. Because the lo loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Okay. So this is another important admonition that he's giving. Uh, one of the absolutely essential elements of, of our faith is that of being a community. That's another reason why not coming to Mass is, is so difficult for us. We don't, it's not just me and God. It's me as part of a believing community and our Lord Jesus who leads us to the Father. So, uh, again, among Corinthians, uh, those who did believe, they believed in their own gods and goddesses. But there was no sense of worshiping together. They would, they would come to the temples and worship as individuals. And so he's saying, no, in, in receiving the Lord, we share in the one body and one blood, and we become, as we see so very clearly, we become the body of Christ. Okay. That's another very important reminder to you. Uh, remember when the, when the minister or priest gives her a priest the host, he or she doesn't say he is the body of Christ. He or she says the body of Christ. Because as we receive Holy Communion, we become the body of Christ. So the community is the body of Christ. The mutual is the body of Christ. Does that make sense? Get away from her stuff. He's trying to kill me. I'm here with the um, attachment. With the attachment. Stay with us. Uh, one thing here with the attachment of scent. Um, this has to do with uh, the Catechism 353 and a word which is called epiglesis. Um, that's where we're going next. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to ask about it because we've been doing so much with the Holy Spirit. Um, Live now. How are you getting this? I can understand you, Marianne. Yeah, um, I, can, I can barely hear you. Okay, I just, um, we're going to go to this because I, I, I wanted to understand 1353. That was a new one. They can hear you. They can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, now we're getting now we're getting better reception, Marianne. So, yeah. for those of you who got the the handout, uh, please uh, turn to it. Okay. Uh, again, I want to give you some some insight from the Catechism of the Catholic Church about this. Um, and let's start with a second page, which gives you definitions of two very important words that are used there. One is an anamnesis. Uh, what what's what's amnesia? Forget loss of memory. Pardon? Loss of memory. Exactly, the loss Forget of memory. Okay, anamnesis. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Amnesia is is to forget. Okay, anamnesis. 
uses the Greek privative, and we all know what the Greek privative is. Whenever you see an A or an A-N before a Greek word, it's, it means the opposite of. Okay, so if amnesia means to forget, anamnesis means to not forget. So to remember. Okay. So the, the anamnesis is the remembrance of God's saving deeds in history in the liturgical action of the church. And that inspires thanksgiving and praise. So every Eucharistic prayer contains an anamnesis. You probably never were aware of that, but every in, in every Eucharistic prayer, um, there is a memorial, there's a reminder to us of the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. It usually occurs right after the consecration. Um, and then epiclesis, or some people call it epiclesis, uh, is a prayer that petitions God to send the Holy Spirit so that the offering at the Eucharist may become the body and blood of Christ. The word epiclesis means to send down. It comes from the Greek word plesi, which means to, to send, and epi means to, to send it down, okay, to send down. You'll notice that every Eucharistic prayer, the priest puts his hands over the chalice and pat, and then prays, that God will send the Holy Spirit upon the bread and wine, that they may become the body and blood of Christ. That's the moment of epiclesis, okay? So we're asking God to send the Holy Spirit so that the Eucharist may be confected, so that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Okay? So, so actually, that's a total moment of Trinity because you're praying to God, you've got Christ, the body and blood right there, and you're asking the Holy Spirit to come down. So you have uh, a, a true moment um, of, of epiphany. You know, Absolutely. that's an epiphany of the Trinity. Absolutely. If you pay attention... That's what I was asking you to explain. Okay. I'm sorry? That's what I was asking you to explain. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 it's interesting. If you pay attention, during, during almost every Eucharistic prayer, there are five Trinitarian yeah. prayers. There are five times when God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are spoken of in one sentence. And and we don't pay attention to this. We, we focus on Jesus, and, and rightfully so, because he's the mediator between us and God. But, but even the Eucharist is the work of the, work of the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we receive Jesus in the Holy Communion, we receive God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't just receive Jesus. You, you can't separate them. Uh, and so if you pay attention um, in the Eucharistic prayer, it, it, it happens over and over and over again. And senior, yes. just because you're asking for um, the Holy Spirit to come down with your hands, doesn't mean he come, she, he, the Holy Spirit comes at exact that, that exact moment, though, right? Like there isn't an exact moment of transubstantiation. Yes or no? No. Uh, you, you asked a really good question, uh, and that's why, remember, during, during the Eucharistic celebration, the priest may not leave the altar because we don't know exactly what happens. Um, it, it begins then, but then at, at, at the, um, the actual consecration, we speak Jesus' words where he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And then after the consecration, we remember what God has done. And so... The entire Eucharistic prayer is the moment when the bread and wine is Christ. Okay, so now that you understand those two uh, those two wonderful words, let's... and it, it reminds me of um, catechesis, which is to echo down, which is kind of like our first reading is kind of Moses' catechesis after Passover and before they entered into um, Canaan without him. So brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You're right. Yeah. And I think I think our gospel is also after the second Pentecost as recorded in John. Is that right? No. No, John's this is very early in John's Gospel, chapter six. Okay. The in John's Gospel, the Pentecost occurs after, right after the resurrection. But but isn't there isn't there a Pentecost around um the wedding feast at Cana and and around the time of the um, multiplication of the loaves and fishes? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. If you're, you're talking about where Jesus has come to Jerusalem for a Pentecost. Yeah. Yes, yes. In, in chapter five, you see that Jesus has gone down to Jerusalem. In fact, this whole this whole talk, uh, about like discourse, is given um, when he is in Jerusalem the, for the Feast of Pentecost. Yes. Good. Okay. So let's 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 turn to these these powerful teachings that we find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Eleven oh six says, together with the anamnesis. Okay, that is. Let us never forget, let us always remember, the epiclesis, that is the sending down of the Holy Spirit so the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, is at the heart of the sacramental celebration, most especially of the Eucharist. And here we see a quote of St. John uh, Damascene. You ask how the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine the blood of Christ? I shall tell you, the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. And accomplishes what surpasses every word and thought. Let it be enough to understand that it is by the Holy Spirit, just as it was of the Holy Virgin, and by the Holy Spirit that the Lord, through and in Himself, took flesh. So, John Damascene does a wonderful job of linking the presence of, of Jesus, of God, at the Eucharist, with the presence of God at the Annunciation, where the Holy Spirit. Um, visits the Blessed Mother and announces, I'm sorry, the angel visits the Blessed Mother and announces that by the Holy Spirit, you are to have the Son. So the, the Eucharistic celebration is kind of like a Christmas. It's God coming present in us. The Word becomes flesh. Okay. That's very good. Good. That makes sense? So mm -hmm. then 1333, at the heart of the Eucharistic celebration, are the bread and wine that by the words of christ and the invocation of the holy spirit become christ's body and blood faithful to the lord's command the church continues to do in his memory and until his glorious return what he did on the eve of his passion he took bread he took the cup filled with wine the signs of bread and wine become in a way surpassing understanding the body and blood of christ the goodness of creation and, and this comes uh, in to, to speak against again the, the classical protestant position yeah, come on. Let's, that let's after, the, after come original on. sin come on. Uh, come on. Uh, the world is basically evil come on. Let's go. the very fact that, that god would come to be part of what? the bread and wine makes it clear that the world, the creation, yeah, that's the truth. Right? Yeah, not, we, yeah you know. Yeah. Uh, I can see it. It's super bad. Monsignor, yeah. excuse me. I can't. I really wanted to hear that explanation, and I missed. I couldn't hear you. Would yeah. you mind saying again yeah. what the, the the part where the Protestants what what they believe? Oh, okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, remember that the classical Protestant position is that after the fall of Adam and Eve. The, the world, the universe, is basically evil. And the only way we're saved is by having our sins whitewashed by Jesus as he presents us to the Father. Here, uh, the Catholic Church it, it speaks against that. We believe that, that creation remains good. And a, a, a clear indication of that is that God would enter into bread and wine, very much part of the earth, of creation and use it to save us. Do you know why? Why do they not believe that the body in Christ, the body in Christ is in the bread and wine, that it's just a symbol? Yes. Well, it, 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 it's all based on what I'm, what I'm just mentioning, that uh, God couldn't be part of evil. And since the oh. world is evil, then it can't be. He can't be part of it. Okay. Oh. But he, they don't believe that Jesus gave them the power to forgive and to retain, and that he said, this is my body, this is my blood. He didn't say this is a symbol of my body and blood. They don't believe that. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. and, and is their belief so strong that the world is evil, that that transcends anything else? 
Yeah. Wow. Now, now let me let me be very careful with this for a moment. Uh, Martin Luther did, in fact, believe that the bread and wine became the body and blood of Christ, while the community was present. But, but he did not believe in transubstantiation. He could not believe that the bread and wine actually took on the substance of God. He believed in what we call consubstantiation, in that because God is separate from us, the bread and wine now take on both the substance of God and the substance of bread. Does that make sense to you? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Interesting. And remember, and for the, even for Martin Luther, it was the bread and body and blood of Christ only while the community was gathered. Once, once the community dispersed, it became bread and wine. Monsignor, I, I Sorry, it's Kenneth. I have written down Lutherans say it's a memorial, which is consubstantiation, but they, there's also a range of beliefs, beliefs within the body, then it becomes the body and blood, or their faith changes it to the body and blood. Right. So, depending on the sect of Lutheran, well, um, yeah, the you think? range within the Lutherans and the Methodists and even the Episcopalians uh, as to is it really the body and blood of Christ or is it just a memorial? You'll find that none of them have tabernacles. Yeah, so right. that after the mass is over or after their celebration is over, it, it, they just put it back in the drawer and it's just for the life. But in your high Episcopal, high Lutheran, high Methodist, they do believe that it becomes the body and blood of Christ while the community is assembled through consubstantiation rather than transubstantiation. Well, that's that's some pretty heavy duty theology, right? Yeah. There. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. Monsignor. Yes. Monsignor, um, I just had one other um, analogy for you. When you were referring to the Gospel of John, and you mentioned the vine and the branches, the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. Um, I also thought of the unborn child, right? Feeding on the mother, you know, connected to the mother. And then when you referred to the catechism that 1106 and the, and the correlation there to how the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary and took flesh. And I just thought it is really all tied together there, you know? Yeah. I, I second yeah. that. Brilliant, wow. Beth. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll let it sit on that one. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. yeah. Good, good. Because right. that, the passage that you read, um, after uh, 1106, really to me makes Mary even more important as the carrier. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. I, I, I think I've said this before. Maybe I haven't said it in this context. Is, is as unfortunate as this zooming is, I'm, I'm finding you're 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 being more willing to share, and I really. I really appreciate that. The insights that you have are really precious, so thank you. That's because you're a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, back to that sentence in 1333. Thus, in the offertory, we give thanks to the Creator for bread and wine, the fruit of the work of human hands, but above all, as fruit of the earth, and of the vine, gifts of the Creator. So we, again, in, in opposition to what classical Protestantism believes, and I, I'm, I always say that over and over again, remember that you don't find most Protestants believing this today. Of course, most Protestants don't know what they believe. But, but the classical position is that <clears throat> everything here on earth is, is so stupid, it's evil. We take bread and we take wine and we Thank God for these blessings. They're good. Okay. The church sees in the gesture of the king priest Melchizedek, who brought out bread and wine, a prefigure of her own offering. <clears throat> bread and wine have been used down through the ages in many religions as as the offering. It's it's the standard you know it's the standard food. No matter, no matter where you go, you get bread, and in most places you get wine. 
done. And then we see here in the institution narrative, that the institution narrative is when the priest is starting with the officials. So we, it's the institution of the Eucharist. We make it happen. Okay? The power of the words and the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit made sacramentally present under the species of bread and wine, Christ's body and blood, his sacrifice offered on the cross once for all. So here we see very clearly that as we call the Holy Spirit down upon the bread and wine, it becomes the body and blood of Christ. Okay. Got that? And then we have in 1376, the Council of Trent summarizes the Catholic faith. Now remember this is the Council of Trent. So this is um, speaking directly in opposition to what the Protestants are teaching. Declares, because Christ our Redeemer said it was truly his body and that he, that he was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the Church of God. And this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. So that's where it was, it was finally defined, but that term has been used now since I believe it was Aquinas that was Transubstantiation. Monsignor, so, yes. Oh, sorry. In my lifetime, I've always just received hosts. When did the actual host come into being as opposed to bread? What? what? In other words, I've always received the host, right. yeah. you know, not a piece of bread. When did that become? Was there a time? 18th, 19th century when they were doing actual bread? Yeah. Or were, were there always special bakers making a host? Let me try it that way. Okay. Uh, the, the original Passover, and even today the Passover, uses a special bread. It's unleavened bread. Yeah. And... <clears throat> That has always been a custom within the church to use unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. When, okay. when, did, when did it become the host? When did it become that stamped host that we use today? I, I don't know exactly when that became, but, it, but, it, but it's always been unleavened bread. Is that, is that what you're okay. asking? Yeah. Yeah, that, that sort of answers it. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the round host that we use now, I, I think that's when the nuns started making their living out of, uh, out of making them. I don't know when that happened. Monsignor, and also the host, not that the host isn't important, but when you do the prayers for the consecration, that's when it's important. Is that right? Do that making, making of the host, that isn't to me the important part. It's when it's in mass and you're saying your prayers and it becomes the body and blood of Christ. That's when it's important. So... I don't really care who makes the host. Uh, I don't yeah, mean that meanly, but that wasn't what I was asking. <laughs> okay. No. So I, I think the question was when, when did it stop being, you know, a, a piece of bread that you're familiar with as a piece of bread, even, even though unleavened, and it becomes a host, that, that cracker like thing that we eat yeah. now. Yeah. And exactly when that happened, I, I, I don't. Yeah. So one of the parishes here in Michigan that we belonged to before we moved to Pennsylvania still bakes their own bread, unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. and it's flat and it's kind of um, mm, skewered, you know, or scarred, scarred, so whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was some controversy when we first got there because some people, like they were putting honey in it. They have people volunteer to bake the bread. And they were putting yeah. things in it that they weren't supposed to. It was a kind of a big uproar. Where, I, where I see your point, Carol. Is that, right. Like I don't really care what it is once it gets on the altar. But some people did care. Like yeah. give me unleavened bread as it as the church um, requires. I guess. Um, so, yeah. no well, honey. I've been, yeah. I've been to a home there where the person made unleavened bread, 
and the priest used that. Yeah. It wasn't in host form. He broke in someone's the, house. The way yeah. <laughs> the way it originally was said. Yeah. yeah. At, at my first mass, I used unleavened bread. Right. But but it becomes uh, that even unleavened bread is is too large. We have that huge yeah. warrior. Oh the, sure. Or, Mm -hmm. If you have small communities, you can do that. With larger communities, it just becomes unreal. And then there's crumbs in your hands, and you don't want that to fall <laughs> on the floor. Seriously, like I'd lick my finger and make sure I get it all. Like it's you're just right. a little you're messy, right. kind of. No, you're right. You're right. And you're I right. want it to be respectful, I guess. So. Right. Absolutely. And for all those reasons, most most places don't. Do Monsignor, I love the theatricality of. Your first mass. Uh, um, actually, I watched the streaming on on um, at nine thirty on Sunday, not at five. You had the really big host, and I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you. That, that's I use every Sunday. Yeah, I know. But I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it uh, today or last Sunday. It just was really huge. It was like bravo for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, before I didn't have to use it because the, the cameraman just zooms in on me. Yeah. But now that we don't people in, people in the back pew need to see the host. Yeah. Okay, then number 1377 here. So 1377, the Eucharistic presence of Christ. Now, somebody asked this question, when does it happen? It begins at the moment of consecration and endures as long as the Eucharistic species subsist. So, unlike what your Protestant communities believe. He believe that once the host is consecrated, it remains the body and blood of Christ. That's why we, we treat it with such respect and keep it in the center. The Christ, the Christ is present whole and entire in each of the species and whole and entire in each of the parts in such a way that the breaking of the bread does not divide Christ. And that's also true with the, with the blood. Right now, we're not, we're not sharing the cup. Uh, you you receive our Lord fully in the, both the bread and the wine. The reason the, the custom has developed now in certain parishes and ours of sharing the cup for those who want to do that is again we're we're, we're incarnational people. We need signs, mm -hmm. and the bread doesn't look like wine. The wine doesn't look like bread, but they are both truly the full presence of God. Jesus Sorry, Monsignor Kines again. It doesn't really speak to the resurrected Christ, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But the very fact that they use the word Christ uh, makes that very evident um, for anybody who knows their theology. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Sorry. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, theologians distinguish between the Jesus of history and the Christ of the resurrection. So whenever you see uh, a mention throughout the catechism or any, any good teachings, it refers to Christ, it refers to the risen Lord as opposed to Jesus, which believes speaks of Jesus in the public ministry. But, but you make a really good point. You know, when we receive Holy Communion, we're not receiving our Lord on the cross. Yeah. We're receiving the risen Lord. Resurrection. So the, the, the Eucharist, as some, I think it was Bumori who said, that the, the, the Eucharist that we receive here is in anticipation of sharing in the fullness of our Lord in the heavenly banquet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a so, senior. Go ahead. Peggy? Yes. yes. I, I'm always confused oh. because I feel as soon as we come in, I mean, like Christ is always with us. And then when we say, you know, in the consecration that, you know, Jesus is with that. I, I, it, it always confuses me. You know, I thought, you know, Christ is with us always. So why, I don't know, I find it difficult when you say the presence of Christ is at the consecration. It's almost like a remembrance, but we're not supposed to, you know, it's not, it's not a remembrance. Can you explain that? Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah I, the way I said it. <laughs> No, no as, as I as I mentioned earlier, yeah, God is God is present to us all the time. If, if God said this over and over again, if God forgot about us for a split second, 
you'd not only die, you would cease to exist. Yeah. Simply wouldn't mm -hmm. exist. Okay. So yes, you're absolutely true. God is present always with us. But the difference, and, it, and this is significant, the difference is in the Eucharist. It is God giving himself to us in a, in a sign that we can understand bread and wine. We understand bread and wine, uh, which anticipates for us something we don't understand, and that is being in the heavenly banquet. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a real presence that is different from his true presence in our midst uh, that keeps us in existence. So it's, again, as I said, it's a both and. As, as Ed mentioned, you know, watching Mass, virtually receiving the spiritual um, uh, communion, those are all good ways to realize that God is truly with us all at all times. But all the sacraments are given to us because we need signs. We, we, we need to touch things and see things to give us a clearer indication of God's presence. Does that make sense? I think mm -hmm. so, yes. Thank you. Would, well, it be, would it be correct to say that the, because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us, that we're able to eat from the tree of life that was denied to Adam and Eve? Hmm. Hmm. Um, Wait, wasn't it the tree of knowledge? I'm sorry? Wait, the tree of knowledge? Tree of knowledge. There are two trees. Right. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was the one that they ate from. But in the middle of the garden was the tree of life. Life. And remember that? That very good. That 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 was a symbol of the of Adam and Eve being able to share in God's presence for all eternity. If they hadn't sinned, they would have lived forever. Um, but remember, uh, as as we as we sing so beautifully in the uh, Easter Vigil. Um, the fall of Adam and Eve was actually a happy fault, Felix Culpa, a happy fault, because Adam and Eve, if they hadn't sinned, they would have lived forever in the Garden of Eden. Right. We were privileged, however, to live in heaven. And so the tree of life would have kept them alive here on earth. In the but Eucharist, God in the walk I'm sorry? But didn't God walk with them in the garden? So in a way, it was kind of heaven on earth. But he doesn't live there. He only visits. That's what I told my students. He doesn't live there. He comes down and visits, but then he goes back to heaven. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, we're speaking in, a, in analogous terms here, and we're speaking mythologically here. But, yeah. but the message is that, yes, that it, it was actually a happy fault that Adam and Eve sinned because that that started the ball rolling to get God back in in our midst through His Son Jesus Christ, who then nourishes us through His body and blood, that leads us back to God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Well, this has been pretty heavy theology, hasn't it? <laughs> we are we are so blessed to believe that that is truly the body and blood of Christ that nourishes us in this world, and that leads us to eternal glory. And never forget that at Mass, not only do we receive the body and blood of Christ, we also give the body and blood of Christ back to the Father as our thanksgiving, as we, that's why we call it the Eucharist. And, and, remember whenever the priest pours the water into the wine, we join our sacrifice, our lives, to our Lord Jesus, in offering ourselves to God. We kind of piggyback on that and are able to offer ourselves to God. Thanksgiving. So remember all of that next time you're at Mass, okay? Thank you. Great. Good, good. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, uh, I, I do want to let you know about this wonderful gift that Paul Peterson, one of our parishioners, has has prepared for us. It'll be um, it'll be in the uh, as, a, as an attachment to the block notes announcement and is also uh, part of the webinar. It's a it's a it's a 34 slide PowerPoint presentation on the real presence in the Eucharist. It's uh, it's really brilliantly done. It's the result of his years and years of teaching uh, of theology uh, to high school students, 
and he's, he's uh, sifted it down into this wonderful presentation. So I, I really strongly encourage you to read it, spend some time meditating on it. It's, it has it has all kinds of really wonderful, wonderful theology, uh, as well as great artwork. So, will it so be on the website? Too? It'll be on, you know, it, I, I can actually just send it all to you directly, too, but it, it, it will be on the website and it will be as a link to the flock code announcement this weekend. I'm not a parishioner anymore, so I need your help. <laughs> You're not part yes, of Yes, you are. You're in our hearts. <laughs> You don't get our phone messages? No, not anymore. Not anymore. I, I live in Michigan? I don't know. Oh, what? <laughs> we are all the body of Christ. Okay. Yes. Amen. Good. Well, thank you. See you all next week. Thanks, Monsignor. God bless. Monsignor, don't, Monsignor, don't forget to turn off the recording. Thank you. <laughs> As it was in the beginning, is now, whatever shall be, world without end. Um, may the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor.